Here's a list of agents that came up under the search query short story collections. I'm sorry to say that there are only two pages of agents interested in marketing short story collections listed here. A considerable drop from the heyday of short story collections in the 80s and 90s. Still, in addition to these agents, it's possible to submit story collections to many well-known university presses and contests like the Iowa Short Fiction Award, the Flannery O'Connor Prize, and the Drew Hines Prize. Run a Google search for these and you'll see what I mean. As writersmarket.com shows, many of these listings have been recently updated. So whatever you might be looking for, you can be sure that the listings are fairly recent. Some literary magazines change editors all the time, and it's always a good idea to get the name of the editor right when you write a cover letter. Unfortunately, too, literary magazines can sometimes have brief lives and may no longer be published after a year or two. Even with all the advantages of buying a copy of the novel and short story writer's market every year, and getting a free subscription to writersmarket.com. In recent years, I've found the website for Poets and Writers magazine, www.pw.org, to be a better resource, at least as detailed and sometimes more recent in its listings. In many ways, easier to navigate than writersmarket.com, and it's free. Like the novel and short story Writers Market, the Poets and Writers list of literary magazines is wide and deep, searchable by genre, and its tools for writers include updated information on writing contests, small presses, writing conferences, workshops and residencies, literary agents, as well as jobs for writers. In this graphic, under Tools for Writers, Poets and Writers also keeps us up to date with new magazines recently added to the list. Like the novel and short story writer's market, Poets and Writers lists each magazine with a short description of what genres it publishes, whether it accepts electronic and simultaneous submissions, and what months of the year its reading periods cover. If you click on the individual links to each magazine, you get a detailed description of the magazine and A direct link to that magazine's web page, which usually supplies all the information about submissions you might need to know, and as shown here, often shows back issues which you may sample from to get a sense of what the magazine publishes and how suitable your work might be for submitting it to this publication. This magazine, the Black Warrior Review, one that I used to be a faculty advisor for when I taught at the University of Alabama, for example, is where Jeannie Libby got her start as an editor. And because of the magazine's reputation as one of the most prestigious magazines run exclusively by MFA students, she went almost immediately from receiving her MFA to becoming an editor at the Southern Review, working her way up to senior editor in just a few short years. One of the best descriptions of quality fiction and the literary short story I can think of is one that former editor Esquire and current editor of Narrative Magazine, Rust Hills, makes in his book, Writing in General and the Short Story in Particular. Slick fiction, he writes, and I'm paraphrasing here, makes use of the daydream while quality fiction makes use of the night dream. What does he mean by this analogy? that popular slick fiction often is more interested in wish fulfillment than reality. The boy always gets the girl or vice versa, and each story has a happy ending neatly tied up with a pink or blue bow. Quality literary fiction is exemplified by the literary short story, on the other hand, often makes the same surprising and sometimes absurd or even disturbing turns that night dreams deliver to most of us focusing on our greatest fears and anxieties at times, or taking us to recognitions about ourselves we'd probably rather not know about, making us sit up in our beds and not be able to go back to sleep for at least a few minutes. Both poets and writers in the novel and short story writer's market list a wide variety of magazine types, including commercial publications or slick magazines as some of them are called, but that doesn't mean that the stories in them are slick. They are often of the highest literary quality, and the writers who publish stories in such magazines may make as much as $3,000 a story. 
Writers like F. Scott Fitzgerald, John Cheever, and John Updike were able to make a pretty good living publishing in such venues, though that's hardly the case for most writers today. Some of these magazines, usually listed under commercial or consumer publications, include Gentleman's Quarterly, The New Yorker, Harper's, and The Atlantic Monthly. In addition to such high-quality, slick magazines, under the designation Literary Magazines, Writer's Market and Poets and Writers also list many venerable, high-tier literary magazines that publish the highest quality short fiction. Magazines such as The Georgia Review, The Gettysburg Review, Glimmer Train Stories, The Kenyon Review, The Paris Review, The Southern Review, Plowshares, Shenandoah, and many others. Also, under the same designation, literary magazines, writers may find such gorgeously produced, innovative, and relatively new literary magazines as Believer, McSweeney's, Tin House, and Zoe Trope's All Story. Literary magazines that I would call mid or low tier, not because they're necessarily of lesser quality, but because they have a lower circulation than some of the high tier literary magazines, are also listed in both publications, some listed under the designation literary magazines, some under the designation of small circulation publications. Many of the better known mid tier literary magazines, often connected to creative writing MFA programs, include American Short Fiction, The Black Warrior Review, The Crab Orchard Review, The Florida Review, Hayden's Ferry Review, The Iowa Review, The Indiana Review, The Missouri Review, New Letters, Quarterly West, Willow Springs, and many others. Almost all literary magazines now have an online presence, so writers looking for venues to publish their stories online can access those magazines directly from such web pages as the Poets and Writers. But other magazines, zines as they're sometimes called, have an exclusive online presence only. One of the most interesting of these I've seen is Web del Sol, a kind of clearinghouse of online literary magazines and zines including links not just to Web del Sol magazine, but to many others, as well as many other literary links that writers can spend hours exploring, such as eScene and eScene 2, Best Lit on the Web, Best Journals on the Web, and many other links. Such online magazines as Web del Sol has, have also helped in an explosion of other online literary magazines designed exclusively for the web, such as the Cortland Review, which includes not just short stories and work in other genres, poetry and creative nonfiction especially, but also real audio recordings of the authors reading their work. The possibilities for publishing work online have become almost unlimited, and the growth in online literary magazines hasn't even begun to abate. Of course, all the resources we've discussed here, online marketing sites, literary magazines, online magazines, and so on, help us to become better readers and writers of the contemporary short story form. For this reason and others, it's probably best to use as many of them as you can, or can afford, to educate yourself on many of the exciting new stories being written now and in the future. When I first started submitting stories, I hand-typed my cover letters, envelopes, and self-addressed stamped envelopes, and I kept up with which story I'd submitted to which magazine by tossing a copy of the letter into a cardboard box. Unfortunately, this process was messy and time-consuming, and I realized I needed to streamline the process so that I could send a rejected story out to the next magazine I wanted to send it to immediately, say, within five minutes, without agonizing about rejection. And what I came up with I thought might also help my students submit their stories too. 
Those of you taking this class online may find these publishing supplements under the Blackboard menu Course Content, Course Supplements, Publishing Supplements. These include a literary magazine database, a literary magazine submission tracker, all ranked according to categories I've used to clarify the types of magazines contemporary short story writers might submit to, as well as a sample cover letter and a submission template. The Literary Magazine database comes in both Excel and comma delimited formats and includes the magazines that both the Best American Stories and the O. Henry Awards editorial staff consulted fairly recently in 2008. Contacts which students may import directly into their computer address books. The Literary Magazine Submission Tracker, basically an Excel spreadsheet, includes these same magazines ranked by number and color, including an automatic calculation of the days it takes for submissions to return to you with a rejection or an acceptance. And I've listed descriptions of those rankings as a starting point for students considering sending their stories out. These rankings, of course, are based mostly upon my experience with hundreds of literary magazines over the last 20 years, but they may also be subjective. For this reason, you shouldn't dismiss any magazine I've listed here out of hand unless you've taken a close look at it on your own. Of course, I'd be glad to see your rankings too, just to see which magazines I need to look at more closely myself. The sample or model cover letter shows the basic template and text I begin with when I submit a new story. And the student submission template is a basic template in Microsoft Word format that students may change or revise for their own uses to begin their own journey towards publication. Of course, the first step is always to write a publishable story in the first place. That's what workshops are for, right? But these templates can save you significant time in getting your stories out into the world. Though I'm not big on giving prescriptive advice, Here's a bit of basic advice about cover letters, which you're free to ignore. First, don't describe your story or tell the editor how incredibly brilliant or wretched you think it is. <laughs> Let the story speak for itself. An editor will assume you've spent months, even years, working on this story until it's as well-crafted and professional as you can make it. While some editors will send back handwritten notes, stories that are sloppy full of grammatical errors and otherwise unprofessional will usually just receive a form rejection. Professionally well-crafted stories may too, so don't assume your story's bad just because it came back with a form rejection. Just send it out to the next place on your list or spend some time revising it before you send it out again. Second, in the first paragraph, just make a simple statement that you are submitting the story for publication. It's up to the editor to decide whether the story is publishable or suitable for her particular publication. Third, in the second paragraph, describe your credentials as specifically and briefly as you can. It's taken me several decades to build this paragraph, and it may take you some time to build your own. If you haven't published yet, simply write that you're studying for your MFA and where. Fourth, in the last paragraph, just to make a simple statement of conclusion and then get out. Some magazines, like the Georgia Review, request that writers not make simultaneous submissions. But many more accept simultaneous submissions so long as you let editors know in your cover letter. If the magazine accepts them, send them out. If not, don't do it. I've had to explain to more than one editor that my story had been accepted elsewhere. And sometimes, especially if the editor prefers no simultaneous submissions, that can be an unpleasant experience. Years ago, I realized that requesting a manuscript to be returned in an SASC is a probably a waste of time and money. Usually it arrives smudged and covered with coffee stains, not something the next editor would want to receive. So request that the editors toss the story into the recycling bin and then send a note and a simple SASE just for that purpose. If I receive a response on the magazine's letterhead, I can almost guarantee that the magazine has accepted my story and included a contract for me to sign. On the other hand, if I receive the simple SASE I submitted, I know I've probably got a rejection 
something to tack up on my bathroom wall. That's about it. An overview of the contemporary short story and a few supplements and suggestions to help you send your own stories out. If you publish a story written in this workshop, please let me know. One of the true joys of my job is seeing a student publish, especially for the first time. And of course, I'll probably want to share the good news with other students and my colleagues too. Thanks for watching.